Hey, it's Rob with Spread Aviation. If you're here joining us for the live stream tonight, thank you very much for coming out. We're talking today about stalls and about the, the photo that we posted to Instagram and Facebook that was asking you to tell us which of two aircraft was stalled and why. We got a lot of responses for which one was stalled, but the and whys were a little bit uh, all over the place. Uh, so we want to make sure that we can get good information out there so that we don't have answers that are all over the place and it's going to make you a safer pilot when you get into the airplane. So this is the, uh, this is the coronavirus look quarantined in the basement. I uh, hope everybody can relate. <laughs> so I've drawn here a very simple airfoil. It's an asymmetrical airfoil, which means it's not the same shape on the top and the bottom, but that's not necessarily important. We need to identify a couple of pieces and parts of this before we can continue with tonight's live stream. First of all, I want to talk about this piece right here. This is the trailing edge and this is the leading edge. So the rearmost part of the airfoil and the frontmost part of the airfoil. There's an imaginary line that connects these two together. This is a very important line and it is called the cord line. This is the imaginary line that connects the trailing edge to the leading edge. And it, for all intents and purposes, continues on to infinity, but it's not really what we're concerned about here today. The cord line interacts with the relative wind to produce something that makes lift for us. So I'm going to draw the relative wind here. And normally you see this drawn to the leading edge. I'm going to draw it to the trailing edge because it offers a, a, a much bigger uh, view of the angle that we're going to be talking about here. So this is the relative wind. Relative wind is very simply the airflow that is parallel and in the opposite direction of the flight path. Flight path is how the aircraft is actually moving through the air. This is very important because it takes actual motion through the air to determine flight path. Some of the answers and responses that we got said, well, we can't tell because we can't see the flight path. All right, fair enough. However, I did give a big clue in there. All right, moving on. The relative wind is dedicated completely to flight path. And this is how we typically see it drawn in textbooks is on the horizontal, but it's not always there. If the aircraft is climbing, well, there's the flight path. Where's the relative wind? It's equal and opposite. If the aircraft is descending, where's the relative wind? It's equal and opposite. So very much we have to have this motion. Relative wind and the cord line form an angle. And this is a very important angle. This is the angle of attack. That's what's in here. This is a very important angle because it is how our airfoil produces lift or actually it's one of four elements of how an airfoil produces lift. So lift is coming from this equation here. Coefficient of lift times one half rho, that's a Greek letter, times velocity squared times the area of a wing. Well, which one of these can a pilot control? Can, rho is the density of the air, or one half the density of the air. Well, that's temperature and pressure. We can't control temperature and pressure. We can't make it warmer or colder. We can't make the air pressure higher or lower around our wing. That's, that's not something we, the pilot, can do. Velocity, that one we get a lot of comments on. Hey, I can change the velocity of my aircraft, and while that does have a change in the production of lift, I can't instantaneously and in very large amounts change my velocity in order to generate a whole bunch of g-force. So we're going to say, no, we can't really change velocity. The area of our wing, well, can we make our wing longer? No. Can we make it wider? No. Can we make it thicker? No, not really. And even on the wider, I get some comments, oh, well, I can change flaps. Well, flaps really just move the positioning of the trailing edge, unless you have Fowler flaps, and then you have many trailing edges, but most general aviation aircraft don't have Fowler flaps. Those are airliner tools, and they do, they do increase the area of the wing. All right, we'll leave that there for now. So, 
we've eliminated all of these and that leaves us with coefficient of lift. The coefficient of lift has to do with the shape of the airfoil and the angle of attack. AOA. Well, hey, that's right here. So we as the pilot are only able to manipulate the angle of attack. Cool. So that's how we change lift. And lift can also be felt in, uh, in terms of g-force. Like that's an actual acceleration that we can feel. Normally, we're under 1g, one time the force of gravity. That's what you're feeling right now watching this live stream, sitting in your chair. And in the airplane, we have the ability to manipulate gravity for short periods of time and with certain amounts of energy in order to <laughs> make our airplane climb or descend or turn. Hmm. So we actually have the ability to change AOA and G-force. Well, the G-force is our felt acceleration when we change AOA. So let's take this one more step. Let's say we don't want lift to change, uh, like when we're coming into land. Let's say that we're on our approach, we've finished our round out and we're getting into the flare. Previous to rounding out and flaring the aircraft to land, we were at a constant airspeed. But now, when we're trying to land, velocity is going down. Well, if we're trying to maintain level flight and counteract gravity and maintain 1G, Lift has to stay the same. So for our 2,500 pound airplane, as any item on this side goes down, another has to go up in order for this side of the equation to stay the same. So 2,500 pounds, Cessna 172, Piper Warrior. Um, we still want to just maintain level flight and produce 2,500 pounds of lift, but we have a decreasing velocity. So what do we, the pilot, have to manipulate in order to increase that lift, well, we have to increase our coefficient of lift. We have to increase our angle of attack. Cool. But how do we do that? Well, out of the flight controls that are on the aircraft, we have ailerons, we have rudders, and we have elevators. Which one of those do you think we need to use? If you said the elevator, you're ahead of the game. Very good. So we actually manipulate the elevator, and in this case, it's just another airfoil. It's on the back of the airplane, and it's back here, and it's got a little hinge on it. And we'll increase the angle there on the elevator in order to push the tail down, which then pitches the nose up. And if we're maintaining level flight, not changing altitude, and our flight path stays level, but our pitch attitude increases, what do you think happens to the angle of attack? Hmm, it starts to go up. And this is our visual representation of that. Hmm, so this is a much bigger angle than we had before. So as velocity goes down, in order to maintain the same amount of lift, we also have to increase our angle of attack and vice versa. Let's say we don't want to continue climbing. We just finished our climb from takeoff up to our cruising altitude when we were climbing at, uh, let's say, 90 knots. And we want to cruise at 120. What do we do? We start pushing forward on the yoke. We start lowering the elevator, which raises the tail, lowers the nose, decreasing the angle of attack because our flight path is now level. And we reduce the coefficient of lift as velocity increases. And then we trim. We trim to eliminate the forces that we feel in the yoke, in our side stick, in our stick, whatever we're using for our pitch controller. And so the stick, the yoke, the side stick, which is connected to the elevator, is what we use to manipulate the angle of attack. Tonight's live stream is to demonstrate how that yoke, stick, or side stick is actually our angle of attack indicator and how we as pilots can use it to keep track of our angle of attack, to know when we're stalled when we're pretty sure we're not, and how to recover. One last thing, the angle of attack cannot increase to infinity 
as velocity decreases in order to keep us flying. It has a limit, and that limit is called the critical angle of attack. This is the point at which any further increase in angle, decrease in speed, or increase in load factor will result in a stall. Load factor is also known as G. So if the relative wind moves, which it can in turbulent air, if the air moves, the relative wind moves, but that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the straight up wind velocity. Not necessarily, but it does have everything to do with our flight path, our cord line, and our relationship between the relative wind. If we exceed the critical angle of attack, 99% of the time, 99.99999% of the time, it's because we, the pilot, commanded the angle of attack to increase beyond critical. And we're really the only ones that can fix it. Well, at least fix it as quickly and efficiently as possible before the altitude loss and the other bad things happen. So we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight, how to be aware of when we're approaching that critical angle of attack and how to get back below the critical angle of attack and keep the airfoil flying. Very important things. And we'll probably talk about some, uh, some stall spins, skid slips, things like that too. Yeah, hopefully we have time. So <laughs> buckle up, enjoy the ride. It ain't bad. Hey, all right. So we're back and it's a black screen. This is a great way to middle start the, <laughs> to middle start this. Hold on, let me get, click this one. We're almost there. We got socks. Okay, great, but it's not feeding. Oh, I know what's missing. Hold on here. Hold on. We'll get this figured out. We're, uh, we're what you call experts. There we go. Now you should be able to see the inside of the cockpit of some form of aircraft. All right, so this is Rob with the Spread Aviation Monday Night Live Stream. Thanks for sitting through that that intro. It was really necessary to get some of that baseline information out to make sure that we were all on the same page and understood how things were going to go for tonight's live stream. It's a little different. We're not going to be shooting down other aircraft unless we have time later, but we're going to be talking about things that us real world pilots and even sim pilots um, face really every time we, we strap an aircraft uh, to our backs. And uh, head out, out, head on out there into the wild blue yonder. So if you if you didn't see the the entirety of that, uh, go on back and, and restart the stream from the beginning. Uh, if you caught most of it, or you think you're up to speed, great, awesome, and uh, we'll go from here. So a little bit of a departure. We're going to be doing some GA flying. So here I'm using uh, Prepare 3D software, which is basically Lockheed Martin's uh, purchase of Microsoft Flight Sim. And I'm flying the Commander 114. Uh, this is also the aircraft that I used to create a commercial maneuvers uh, video for YouTube. And mainly our, our discussion today is going to be on stalls, uh, exceeding the critical angle of attack, getting back below the critical angle of attack, and how we can use the tools inside the cockpit of whatever aircraft we're flying in order to make sure that we understand what our angle of attack is at any given time. A um, couple of years ago, to celebrate the, I think it was the 65th anniversary of Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier for the first time, he was uh, given a ride in an F-15 by the Air Force. He was in the back, he wasn't in the front. And as he was getting strapped into the aircraft, the, uh, the, the person who was doing the familiar, familiarization with Chuck on what the instrumentation and everything was in the airplane had apparently, and we'll see this, it's not on camera, had apparently told him what the angle of attack indicator was. And Chuck pointed at it and said, that's the stupidest instrument I've ever seen in an aircraft. If you don't know what your angle of attack is, you shouldn't be flying. And so here we're gonna talk about how to, as a pilot, know what your angle of attack is whenever you're flying. So I'm actually fired up here in the old Kent State University practice areas. 
because that's where I grew up. This, that's where I learned about stalls and things uh, using the, the Prepare 3D software, though, because, uh, well, I can't really take you guys in the cockpit with me and do it live. The Internet's not good enough for that. The cell phone towers aren't really good enough. So uh, we'll start off with a plain Jane power off stall. So I'm going to get the aircraft slow. I'm going to put the gear down, do our guts check. Gas is on. Gauges are in the green. Undercarriage is... Come on, down. Mixture's rich. Power is down at 12 inches, 2,500 RPM. C2 both shoulder harnesses and switches. So this is just going to be a plain Jane, straight ahead stall. Uh, heading indicator says north, but I'm actually going south. I just happen to know that. And we're at 3,700 feet. Notice how I'm just trying to hold some altitude here. Got a little bit of a climb going. I'm going to pull that throttle all the way to idle now. And pulling that stick back. There's a stall warning. Relax the back pressure and power back up let's get the flaps going get the gear coming and pitch for positive rate okay all right so maybe that uh now we got uh 3500 feet we'll level the aircraft off accelerate back up to cruise speed and we'll just do maneuvering speed we'll go uh around top of the white arc here so it'll be 20 inches 2500 rpm okay so We've seen that before. We've seen power off stalls before where we stall straight ahead or, or even out of a descent. Not a real big deal, right? But what were our indications that we were approaching a stall? And you all might say, oh, well, the airspeed was going down or the engine was quiet or the stall warning horn came on. And all of those are very good. And it's good if you catch that the stall or that the airspeed is going down, you know, prior to getting to that stall. However, there was one more really key item, and it was actually depicted in the photograph that was on the. Uh, I don't need this. <laughs> there we go. This one. Boom. That was on the. That was on the photo on our Instagram and our Facebook page. And. I'm going to see if we can picture it or if we can point it out this time uh, now that we're going to do, say, a power on stall. Okay, so we're going to slow the aircraft down. There's my gear warning that my gear's not down. But for power on stall, we don't do these with the gear down. Um, if I press, did that fix my heading? No, it didn't. Okay, so 3,700 feet. We're basically doing the same thing here. we got the power down, gumps check, gas is on, gauges are green, undercarriage is up, mixture is rich power is 1225 seatbelt shoulder harnesses and switches and I got a little bit of a climb going on here so I'm going to pull the throttle all the way back and uh, we'll, we'll have that gear horn going off but notice what's happening as we get down to rotation speed okay so there's rotation speed we'll come on full power as the power comes up normally I would have to add right rudder here there's a tiny bit of right rudder not a whole lot and now we're going to pitch for kind of a normal climb attitude this is pretty normal and now we'll just continue to pitch to an excessively high attitude. And that's really the purpose of, of our power on stall training. Uh-oh. And this is the limitation of Sims. They don't handle stall dynamics very well. So we got plenty of altitude. We'll let this thing sort itself out. There we go. Keep that power down. Ooh, stall warning. Ooh, keep, pay attention. That stall warning is happening. We're doing 100 and 140 knots. Okay, anyway. So we lost the 1,000 feet there, a little over 1,000 feet. Okay, but... As we were slowing down into that power on stall, we needed to pay attention to a couple things because the purpose of training power on stalls is to recognize when a stall is about to happen. So on a power on situation, a couple things to give away. Well, was the pitch attitude looking like this, rather normal, or was it excessive? Uh, it was pretty excessive. Okay, so if I see that when I'm climbing out in a real airplane, oh, I need to I need to lower that nose. I need to get that nose down. But what else was happening that told us, hey, you're about to stall? Well, the airspeed went down, yeah. But what else? Stall warning horn came on. Of course it did. But what what happened before that? And it comes down to what was happening with our elevator. So I'm going to slow back down again. I'm just going to keep the nose up. And I'm going to recover a little faster. But look at the little inset. Look at the little inset on the on the window on your bottom left. Where's the elevator? And she's doing it again. <laughs> she's in the tail slide. No going up. <laughs> Prepare 3D just did an awesome hammerhead. 
<laughs> Stalls, as far as airflow is concerned, are chaos. And there's not a computer in the world that can really accurately recreate what happens aerodynamically in a stall. It's very, very tough. But anyway, okay, but what was our warning sign there? Where was the elevator going? And what controls the elevator? Where was our yoke going? Ah. See the yoke moving backwards? See the stick moving backwards and the little inset? Notice how that stall warning comes on just about the same time, same position of the yoke every single time. Okay, so we just did power on stalls and power off stalls. And what was the similarity between them? Where was the yoke for each one of those? It was, it was back. And it wasn't back like a little bit, it was back a lot. Okay, so if you, the pilot, are flying your airplane and you're in a position where you don't want to stall, but you notice that yoke is getting really far back, you need to push. You, you need to absolutely push. And if you're in a bank, roll wings level, add power, go around, do whatever it takes to get out of there. And that's, that's part of the other point of this is that our recovery from these stalls is really, it's a go around. Unload. So we push first. We push that yoke forward, reduce the angle of attack, add power, and then if the wing is flying, then we can pitch for that VY attitude, that normal climb attitude. Okay, so that was kind of the private pilot, commercial pilot stalls, the power ons, the power offs. But stalls can happen at any attitude. They can happen at any airspeed. And we heard the stall warning going off on that one recovery, on that first recovery we did from the, the crazy little stall that the airplane did. And the airspeed was up around 130, 140. And we were hearing stall warning. Well, where was the yoke? It was really far back. Now, the purpose of a stall warning horn is to alert you to the proximity to the critical angle of attack. And there are times when the critical angle of attack is actually our friend. Critical angle of attack, if you remember from the video at the beginning, is the point at which any further increase in angle, decrease in speed, or increase in load factor will result in a stall. But that also means it's the maximum. And in terms of an algebraic equation, any figure in there that is at its highest possible value is going to make the equals side of that equation, the highest it can possibly be for all the other conditions in that equation. So CL coefficient of lift max is the critical angle of attack. It's the most amount of work you can get out of your wing at any given combination of density, altitude, airspeed, or wing size and shape. So there's quite possibly times when you need to be at that CL max. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. That's a little bit of a teaser. Okay, so for both of those stalls that we just did, power on and power off, the aircraft stalled when we got down there to the bottom of the green arc or the bottom of the white arc. So that's our 1G stall speed. And technically, bottom of the white arc and bottom of the green arc are our 1G max gross weight full forward CG stall speeds. So if we're a little bit lighter um, or the CG is a little bit aft of, of completely forward uh, or at the forward limit, then you, you actually get a couple more knots. That's, that's not bad. That's a nice little buffer. Um, but there's this other common knowledge element out there that as you increase in bank angle, stall speed goes up. That's not necessarily true, but we do know that as bank angle goes up, the amount of g-force required to maintain altitude goes up. Well, if you remember from the equation on the board at the beginning, g-force is just lift. So. In order to make more lift, you need more coefficient of lift, angle of attack, and you need more velocity. 
So here I am at 4,000 feet and 30 degrees of bank. Let me increase to 45 degrees of bank and give me a little more back pressure, so a little more angle of attack. Notice I'm pulling back more and more and more. And the airspeed's dropping, but I'm trying to increase the power to keep the airspeed from dropping. The airspeed's dropping because of drag, an increase in induced drag. And now I'm going to increase the bank angle to 60 degrees of bank. Still at, still at 4,000 feet here, 60 degrees of bank, and I'm at full power. I need a little more back pressure, a little more G. And notice, you know, we're holding this thing okay. We're losing a little bit of altitude. So I did, oh, there we go. So what was that? That was about 90 miles an hour. I think that's miles an hour. That might be knots. No, nope, it's knots. That was 90 knots is what this particular aircraft needs in order to generate 2G. So here I am. I'm just sitting at 90 knots, still at 4,000 feet, but I'm not in a turn. What would happen if I pull back on the yoke to the same position that it was in when I was at 60 degrees of bank trying to command two Gs? What do we think is going to happen with regard to stall? Well, we're about to find out in three, two, one. Here we go. Ah, it didn't have the energy to give me that commanded two Gs. So as soon as the yoke got back to that same position where the stall happened with our power on stall, with our power off stall and our 60 degrees of bank at two Gs, as soon as the yoke got back to the same spot, what happened? Stall warning horn. Same exact position. Well here, huh, that was 60 degrees of bank. So stall speed doesn't necessarily go up, but the required speed velocity in order to get the G or load factor required to maintain altitude, that does go up. Now, if you still don't believe me, if it were true that stall speed went up as bank angle increased, regardless of the back pressure, or the positioning of the yoke, or the angle of attack, then once I hit, say, 70 or 80 degrees of bank, this aircraft should stall. And certainly at 90 degrees of bank, it should stall. Well, it's kind of time to prove that wrong. So I'm going to leave the elevator in the center and I'm going to roll the airplane. We're definitely slower than 90 right now. Did anybody hear any stall warning horns? I didn't. I didn't change the power. Heck, let's do it again. We wound it up to the left. Let's unwind it to the right. The yoke is in the center. It's not coming back. I'm not changing the elevator. I'm not changing the angle of attack. Didn't change power. We should have stalled according to the common knowledge. You can't see me using air quotes here. The common knowledge <laughs> that stall speed goes up with bank angle. And it's just not quite true. But the required velocity in order to maintain altitude, in order to generate the lift required to maintain altitude, does go up. So I was actually willing to sacrifice altitude there. But I started with some nose up. I started with a climb, got into a little descent at the end, and I traded up for some down, and we're fine. Now, do not, do not go rolling your non-aerobatic aircraft. Don't do it. Okay, this is not a tutorial on how to make that happen. Okay, so don't get me in too much trouble there. Oh, Rob did it on the internet. No, 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 no. That's not what I was doing. Okay, so um, one more point is that in knife edge flight at 90 degrees of bank, there's not enough lift available in the wing to maintain level flight because the wing is now producing lift on the horizontal. And now we're at the mercy of gravity. So we're in, a, we're in an upset attitude at that point. Nose down, power down, unload the aircraft, roll to wings level, pitch for VY, power up through the climb, and uh, assess altitude, airspeed, air crew, aircraft, and ATC. All right, so we're looking good there. We're back up 4,000 feet, lots of altitude, lots of altitude for this stuff. And yeah, 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 it's a sim. I get it, I get it. Okay, but... Let's do the dreaded turn in a stall again. Um, you may have heard from your flight instructor, from other pilots, don't turn in a stall. It'll lead to a spin. Well, that's not quite true either. 
Uh, here I'm going to set up for the classic base to final kind of uh, scenario here. We're at 30 degrees of bank. We're slowing down. We've got the power down. I'll even give it some flaps. There we go. And as we get slower, that's my stall warning horn. And we're going to stall the aircraft and hopefully she'll be nice and gentle because she does do that simulator thing. Maintain that 30. Trying to keep it coordinated here, but I'm running out of rudder. There we go. In the real airplane, you don't just snap into a spin if you're coordinated. Okay, so I'm trying to keep the ball in the center really, 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 really good. I'm trying to fly it really well for you. But, uh, and it's harder, it's harder than a real airplane. But where's my yoke? My yoke's coming back. Trying to keep that bank angle the same. Got a little bit of opposite aileron. This doesn't help as far as the yaw is concerned. But if we can stall the thing coordinated, she won't actually spin. There we go. Oh, that's gear warning. Okay, full power, flaps up, gears up. Okay, come on, flaps. There we go. Um, okay, so a coordinated stall in a turn isn't going to result in a spin. Um, even if we were uncoordinated in the slipping variety. So here I am, left-hand turn. Notice where the ball is. The ball is to the left. If you see in the inset with the rudders, you can see I'm applying a whole lot of uh, right rudder. I'm not pointing the rudder at the ground. So if I ever have to figure out which way I want to slip an aircraft, say I'm too high coming in to land and I want to, I want to, I want to put it into a slip. Never ever point the rudder at the ground. This is this is key number one because even if I do stall this thing right now. Oh, well, it's the, it's the sim. She's not happy. Let's pull the power back. Let's go forward because she seems to like that. Okay, power idle. There's that stall warning again. Okay. So we were able to recover it. And that recovery actually isn't the worst recovery in the world. Let me explain that for just a second. If you're in a situation where you absolutely cannot tell whether the aircraft is nose up, nose down, say it's nighttime, or you accidentally flew into a cloud and got disoriented and stalled the airplane, I am, I am, not, I am not saying that this should be your number one um, action item, okay? But if you are completely out of options, ideas, at, the, at, at whatever moment, and you haven't hit the ground yet, let go of everything. Just let go. Because the airplane, it wants to fly. It wants to fly. If I'm doing really nasty stuff to it and I let go, it wants to fly. All right? They're airplanes. They're, they're stable. It's not a helicopter. A helicopter. A helicopter needs the pilot to still be in command of it in order to keep it flying. But... If you're absolutely last ditch effort, this is the only thing you have left, you can let go and the airplane will try and fly. But uh, as soon as it starts flying again, you need to figure out what attitude you're in and get the aircraft back level or even better, climbing at VY, if able to get rid of, get, get away from terrain or, or obstacles or anything like that. Okay, so lots of altitude for us to practice here. Let's see, we did uh, power-ons, power-offs. We did stalls in a turn. Um, we did a slipping stall there. And the simulator really took the crossover on it. Uh, the real airplanes generally don't have enough rudder authority to cause the airplane to cross over. Uh, normally, if you're sitting in, say, a, a left bank with a whole bunch of right yaw on the aircraft, you have this opportunity to catch the aircraft right about here, right before it gets over, uh, and unload at that point. And, and uh, she generally won't. Uh, you can you can prevent the spin from developing any further than that. Uh, however, most general aviation aircraft, they'll just kind of sit here and, and buff it and wiggle on you. But the sim, the sim doesn't know that. But it is very interesting that it is doing the crossover, in that it's it's always going to spin 
in the direction of yaw. Now yaw isn't just what's being applied by the rudder pedals, uh, but it's also what could be coming from p-factor and torque and spiraling slipstream and uh, uh, maybe there's some extra drag on the left side of the aircraft or right side of the aircraft because, it, uh, because of the way it was built or the way it was rigged or you've got a GoPro out on the wing or something like there's there's a hundred thousand different things that could cause the aircraft to uh, go one way or the other but generally the ball is your indicator of coordination and we always want that ball in the center we always want the ball that we see right right where's my cursor there it is the ball that we see right here we want that in the center we don't want it out to the side so the rule is step on the ball if you're in a turn coordinate the airplane step on the ball so I gave that rule earlier of never ever uh, point the rudder at the ground I'm gonna finish the phrase never ever point the rudder at the ground for anything more than coordination Okay, keep the airplane coordinated. And if you do need to slip, you do need to uncoordinate, away from the ground is what we're looking for. So uh, that really comes into play in the traffic pattern. So if it's left-hand traffic, you're gonna be doing right rudder slips. If it's right-hand traffic, you're gonna be doing left rudder slips. Uh, but if you're on a straight-in final and your wing's level and you're still high, eh, pick a direction, go with it. Doesn't really matter at that point. Okay. Uh, let's see, yeah, so we did power on, power off, we did the slip skid, we did not do skid. Okay, so let me just get a little more out to you here because I have no idea what chaos is waiting for us as we enter into this, uh, this skidding turn. And so, we're, yeah, we're nice and slow, we're at 30 degrees of bank, and I'm going to uncoordinate the aircraft with inside rudder. So pointing the rudder at the ground, I'm going to stall the airplane, and there she is, she's inverted. So. Uh, nose down, power down, unload, roll wings level, nearest horizon, and pitch for VY. Bring the power back up, coming through the horizon, get the altitude back. So the aircraft rolled all the way over. That was actually the gentlest. I'm so surprised at this thing. That was actually the gentlest it could have done that. And it was exactly what the real airplane is going to do. So let's do one to the right, so just in case people think I was pulling their leg. Uh, all right, so I'm going to pull the power just back to the uh, warning horn there. And I'm going to feed in the right rudder. Oh, nope. She didn't like that. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, we'll do the let go. Okay, the sim started there again. The nearest horizon's over there. A little early on the power, but just a little. Okay. So there it went. For whatever reason, it went with the roll. Or maybe it figured there was that much uh, spiraling slipstream acting from the propeller. I'm not 100% sure why it went to the left there. Uh, and I'll have to double check the tape and see what the ball did. Um, but I was really trying. I was really trying to feed in a whole lot of right rudder. Okay, so excessive amounts of right rudder, back pressure. Yeah, she's still going left. I'm thinking that the P factor, or uh, sorry, not P factor. Well, it could have been P factor. We were nose, nose high there. Uh, or a spiraling slipstream effect is a little too high in this model. Uh, but that's that's the mathematical computation that the machine does. So really, in the real world, that aircraft is going to spin to the right. Flaps still up? Okay, good. Um, all right, so yeah, that's limitations of the sim. Like I said, stalls are chaos. Um, boom. Okay, stalls are chaos, and the, the computer... It doesn't have enough uh, horsepower or programming or calculation behind it in order to really uh, show us what that's going to do in real time. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so we did power ons, power offs, we did all those others. If anybody has any other requests for stalls... Uh, oh, yeah, okay, so that's what I was going to do. Okay, so any attitude. All right, so the any attitude stall... I would say that 99% of the flight training the pilots receive all the way up through commercial uh, and even then unless you're doing something really advanced I mean you're, you're doing uh, straight ahead stalls your wings level maybe you're doing them in a turn if you got a really good CFI uh, but for the most part you see it one time usually right before the check ride when the CFI is like, oh yeah, we haven't we haven't done this yet and it's in the ACS, we gotta, I gotta show you this. Um, but for the most part, we do our stalls 
upright, straight and level. And in the aerobatic world, uh, we stall all over the place. Like we'll be nose high, nose low, we'll be upright, we'll be inverted, we'll be knife edge. Uh, we'll see all kinds of stuff as, as that training because we want to see it in training so that the first time you see it isn't out there in the real world without somebody with a greater level of experience than you who can fix it if you freeze. So we don't want to freeze, we want to be prepared. Okay, so we already demonstrated earlier how we could roll the airplane, and as long as we didn't pull, we could roll, we could get through and we wouldn't stall. Okay, great, we just did it again. So now I'm just gonna bring the nose back up and leave the power around 20 inches or so. I'm gonna roll the airplane over. Okay, great, we're upside down. Now I'm gonna pull. Hmm, there's the stall warning. It was a little delayed, but here we are, severely nosed down, and I just keep, just keep pulling that all the way back and just keep stalling the airplane. Okay, have I gone through most of the attitudes? At least I've gone through half of them right now. So we were, we were nosed completely down, and we stalled. Holy cow! Uh, here we are, really, really nose up. Stall. Well, this one's not really a surprise. Now we need to push in order to realign everything. Oh, she's gonna freak. Nope. Okay, good. I caught her that time. All right. So any attitude, any airspeed doesn't matter if this angle of attack controller gets all the way back. You are stalled, or are, or you are about to be stalled very, very quickly. Okay? So, if you're ever flying along, and you don't want to be stalled, but you happen to notice, hey, I'm pulling really far back, whether that stall warning horn is on or not, you need to push. You need to recover sooner rather than later. Or else these trees get really close, and that is not how we want to be in our airplane okay all right so i'm going to climb up here and is that full forward yeah it's as full forward as it's going to get okay we're going to climb up a little higher here now va otherwise known as maneuvering speed va is a very magical speed and it does change with weight but va is the speed at which if a full control deflection is made, the aircraft will stall before it breaks. So if you're slower than VA and you give it a full control input, there I gave it roll. Okay, I'm not gonna break anything. Full elevator, it stalled. If the wing stalls, it stops producing lift. If it's not producing lift, it's no longer under stress. It's no longer under load. And so if it's designed to do 10,000 pounds of work, and it's normally only doing 2,500 pounds of work because we're flying along at 1G, but we stall, it's no longer even doing 1G worth of work. So it's designed for 10,000, but it's doing even less than 2,500. It, can you break it? If it's doing way, way, way less work than it was designed to do, no, you can't break it. However, here's what they don't talk about with VA. I'll do a full-scale rotor as well. Yeah, okay, below VA. The other side of VA is that it is only good for one control surface, one direction, one time. So if I'm flying along, and the rudders are also affected by VA. Keep climbing here. I can't just sit here and go stab, 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 and expect not to damage my aircraft, even if I'm below VA. I cannot necessarily expect not to damage my aircraft by going full scale on all the controls, okay? fully expect to break something there. And now here we are at a very high airspeed. If I pull, notice I'm way back on the controls here. I'm gonna unload here, keep the angle of attack very, very low. 
Look at that airspeed, way down below the bottom of the white arc. But did we stall? No, because where was the yoke? I was pushing, I was unloading, and I was keeping, I was keeping the cord line in line with the flight path, which was a parabolic arc. It was going up and over and now down as the nose went up and over and down, and so the angle of attack never really got to increase. But when I was nose down going very high speed, I pulled back to just about the same position. We got no stall warning. We were actually able to load up. Let me pause here. We were actually able to load up probably more G than the aircraft was designed for. Okay, so here's the nose down. Here we are on the pole. And this is our little airplane. They didn't have a, uh, they didn't, they didn't have a, a, a commander in uh, in tack view. So I got the Mooney in here. But here's our AOA 3.8. Here's our G at 1.6, and our airspeed here is just about 160. Indicated airspeed 155 right up top. And then let me slow this down. As we play, as I get on the pole at this very high speed. We'll see what happens to the G-force. Okay, so angle of attack still very low because I got the nose down. Now here we are on the pole. AOA is coming up, the G is coming up 4.9 Gs. There's 5.0 at 181 knots indicated and angle of attack at 20.6. This aircraft is a utility I'm, I'm sorry, is a normal category aircraft with a G limit of 3.8. So by being above VA, I have pulled to the same position that when I was below VA would have resulted in a stall. However, having so much velocity, having so much energy allowed the wing to now begin to generate way more G than what the aircraft was designed for. Well, the wings didn't rip off this time. Did metal change shape? That's certainly a possibility. That's absolutely almost a certainty. But here's the other good news about aircraft design. General aviation airplanes and most others are designed with a 150% load factor limit built in. So a 3.8G aircraft actually has been tested with an additional 1.9Gs. Well, this is really right there. I mean, 3.8 times uh, 1.5, yeah, that's that's 1.9, so that's 4.8 plus 0.9, that's 5.7. It's 5.7 G is where the aircraft, where the spar, where the wing had to survive in testing. And here we are in our nose down attitude with our simulated panic pull, just burying the yoke in our chest. And being this far above VA, we loaded up more G than the aircraft says in the POH its limit is. Now, the normal pilot is going to be uncomfortable way before 5 Gs. Most pilots in the GA world are uncomfortable at 2 Gs, two and a half at the most. To double that at 5 is huge. In the decathlon, I rarely ever pull more than 4 during an aerobatic competition. So to see five Gs here at the bottom of this, of this loop, when staring at the ground with the airspeed coming up and, and being in a panic, seeing that G come up, that's no surprise. That's no surprise. Now the wing is probably gonna stay together, but it's gonna change shape. And if it changes shape, uh, you now have a completely different aircraft and uh, I have no idea how it's going to fly, how it's going to handle or anything like that. Uh, also, like if it's a rental, you know, who's the next one going to be flying it? 
Who was flying it before you? Did they take care of it? These are some of the things to consider when you're doing your pre-flight. Look for, look for misshapen metal. Look for misshapen fabric, uh, because that can be an indication of an overstress. So, um, yeah. I think that's all I've got on that subject. Can't really think of anything else. Um, okay, so if you are, uh, say, you're having a real bad day and you find yourself in a nose down situation, you need to nose down, power down, unload, roll the aircraft, and get on that G. It's okay to get on the G because if you notice, while I was pulling, the airspeed actually froze because all the extra induced drag from my increase in angle of attack, from my increase in coefficient of lift. Um, and uh, if, you, if you need to, pull to that stall warning horn. But if you are above VA and you know you're above VA, you need to be careful about how much you pull because you can hurt the aircraft. And notice the max G, um, well, let me pause here real quick. Notice the max G from the tack view uh, from our previous excursion. Where did the max G occur? As far as the event is concerned, it occurred right at the very bottom of the looping section. We can go a little faster. So right about here, you're staring at the horizon and you're thinking, oh man, I just made it. Oh man, it's it's looking good. We're gonna we're gonna make it. But at 20 degrees of angle of attack, this is your pitch attitude. Your flight path is still 20 degrees down here. It's still down this way. I don't know if I can get it to show that or not. I don't think I can. Um and if you're at max G at this point, that's when the wings are gonna come off. It's your highest velocity, it's your highest G load, and you think, oh man, I made it, snap. No bueno. But unloading, powering down, and then getting on enough G to get your recovery going to help that velocity stay down, I can help you out. But this advice and this training is uh, is not meant for use in the real airplane. You need to get into uh, a real aircraft, like a Super Decathlon or a Pitts or an Extra or at a school that does upset recovery training to really get the maximum benefit of what I'm talking about here. And really, I just want to talk about stalls and how the airplane doesn't stall until this gets back here. That's it. So uh, that's all I got on that subject. If there's anything that anybody has any questions about in the chat, feel free to type that out because uh, I'll see that. And uh, you know, we can do a little bit from there. Here, we're just gonna play the tack view through. Do, 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 do. Actually, got some questions on Instagram while I was sitting here. Okay. Uh, All right, how's that doing? Okay, so yeah, that's our level flight portion. Not a whole lot going on there. Okay. All right, we're back to this. Um, Juan, no problem, brother. I think there's anything else here. Okay, so I'm gonna get my bearings. I haven't been here in a while. Is that Lake Rockwell? There's so many lakes. No, that's Lake Rockwell. It's amazing how uh, the memory works. 
forget where things are. Okay, so yeah, that's not mosquito lake. Uh, no, that's Pima tuning. No, that's Lake Rockwell. Uh, West Branch? Is that West Branch Lake? And then over here, that's Route 59. Uh, on a slip, would you stall then spin? So with the slip, remember slip is is inadequate rudder for rate of turn. So if I'm in a left-hand turn, a slip would be a right rudder input. And in the in most general aviation aircraft, you don't have enough rudder authority to actually cause the crossover that should happen. So that right there, what it just did, where it, it's, it snapped over to the right-hand side, that's called crossover. Um, most general aviation aircraft, your airplane included, do not try this without me in the airplane. Um, do not have the authority to cause the crossover unless you were really, really accelerated on the entry. And that means, like, um, you're well above VS. It's like right now we're doing 100, 100 knots. That's plenty enough energy to get the thing to snap over, but it's going to the left for whatever reason. I don't even know if... This is weird because I'm pressing left rudder and it's snapping to the right, and I'm pressing right rudder and it's snapping to the left. That's quite strange. Um, but in the real aircraft, it will go in the direction of the yaw unless there are other factors that are preventing it from actually climbing that hill. So if you're, if you're slow enough and you stall in a slip, she just sits there and the airplane, like the nose does this, it kind of bucks up and down and, and, it, and it fights and it doesn't know what to do. All the forces are, are counteracting each other. Uh, however, if you're in the same condition but a skid, which is excessive yaw for rate of turn. So here's the skid. Notice rudder towards the ground, and I pull. Notice how she just snaps over onto her back. Okay? So nose down, power down, unload, roll wings level, nearest horizon, and bring the power back up. Okay? Um... Juan, we will not be doing anything that takes us inverted in your airplane whenever we do finally actually get to fly it. Um, but if I if I get uh, if I get the opportunity to bring an aerobatic airplane over, uh, we'll we'll definitely do all kinds of this stuff. We'll put the parachutes on. Uh, we'll do it right. Uh, and and that's that's the key here is is so much of this training uh, needs to be done correctly. We would we. We, we, we need an aerobatic aircraft. We need parachutes uh, so we can go through all of the attitudes that I can't do here in the sim. Like, I can do it here in the sim, but I can't do it in the real airplane legally or safely, okay? Because we already know that this aircraft is a 3.8G aircraft, normal category. Uh, I frequently use more than that, and so uh, having the aerobatic category uh, aircraft is nice for kind of the screw-ups. Now, I do teach the recoveries in the aerobatic aircraft to be well within what these aircraft can do. Normally, we don't pull more than two, two and a half uh, on an upset recovery training flight anyway. Yeah, this the keep the speed up is... It's like the it's the lazy way out. It's the cheap way out. It's 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 the way that those who don't really understand that it's about the angle of attack. It's where this stinking thing is. It's where the yoke is, the side stick, the side yoke, whatever you have for your pitch controller. It's all about where that is, and uh, speed. I don't want to say doesn't matter. It is certainly a part of it. It is certainly a part of it. Uh, but that's one of the things that we do in aerobatic training as well, is we will teach people how to how to roll the airplane at really, really slow airspeed. So like here you can see, airspeed is down around VS. And because I didn't pull, the ailerons were still effective to roll the airplane. She rolled, I don't want to say just fine, but I still had elevator authority, or I'm, I still had aileron authority. And because I wasn't stalled, I still had aileron authority. If you stall, you lose your aileron authority. It's gone. So you, you can you can enact no recovery if the wing is stalled. You can't do it. Um, and so we need to keep that wing flying. That's rule number one. Keep the wing flying. If the wing stops flying, we need to get it back flying and then revert back to rule number one. So rule number one, keep it flying. 
Number two, if it stops flying, get it back flying again. And the way that we do that is we manage the angle of attack. Now, this airplane probably isn't capable of this next demonstration. But if you remember from what was on the board at the very beginning of the, uh, of the live stream here, talking about the critical angle of attack, I have a question that, uh, I don't know, hopefully uh, it may not be obvious. How many critical angles of attack does an airfoil have? You don't have to answer in the chat. Sometimes I just ask these questions of me. But I got this question wrong the first time I was asked. And I was already a commercial pilot, commercial multi-engine. We only ever stall in the non-aerobatic world upright 1G. And we're not going to get a stall warning horn if I stall inverted. This airplane is so poor at it that it probably doesn't even have the authority to do it. But I've got the yoke all the way forward, and if this were an aerobatic aircraft, we'd be stalled right now. And in fact, we're nose up, and we're coming down at 2,000 feet per minute, 1,500 feet per minute. Now she's finally starting to climb again, but an airfoil has two critical angles of attack, and they're on an asymmetrical airfoil, very very different angles. An asymmetrical airfoil, for example, the type that's on a Piper or a Cessna, is designed to fly upright. And it's very efficient when it's upright. But as soon as you roll it over and introduce negative G to the equation, what may have been a positive... Uh, 20 degrees or 17 degrees or 18 degrees angle of attack for the critical angle of attack negative it might be negative 8 negative 9 might be might be as little as half maybe even less than that and that's why if you get into your pilot's operating handbook and you look at the design load factor limits it's normally something like uh, positive 3.8 negative 1.52 it's not even capable of getting you the negative G not capable of even getting there but it's also a structure that's not designed for negative G all right that's about all I've got for today this looks like where am I uh, I don't know what airport this is this is either Akron Canton, but the buildings are on the wrong. Nope, it's Akron Canton. That is the blimp hangar on the left hand side. How did I get this far south? I must have been flying south for a while. I'm actually busting Akron Canton's class Delta right or class Charlie right now. Uh, cool. Okay, below gear off speed. Okay, so we're nice and high here. Uh, some airplanes have placards that say do not slip with flaps extended. Those are mostly on Cessna 172s. That placard is a throwback to the prior to the H model, the H model and earlier Cessna 172s, uh, where they had uh, either no dorsal fin or a tiny dorsal fin. And so they effectively had more rudder authority to get to higher slip angles that could block out the, uh, the elevator or the horizontal stab. Uh, on the side of the empennage where the rudder was deflected to, causing a tail stall. And when the tail stalls, the nose drops uncontrollably, the yoke is ripped out of your hand, and your recovery is actually to pull back. So tail stall, that's a little bit different of a, of a beast. Uh, this is runway five. No, this is Akron Canton. Yeah, this is Akron Canton. I'm, I'm busting Charlie right now. And I'm just holding this slip in because I was really, really high. And now notice as we come into land, I apparently have a crosswind. As the airspeed comes down, the yoke comes back. And we land. Notice where the yoke is. It's all the way back. The same place where we did our stall. So a stall is actually good when we're two inches above the runway. 
that's where we want to stall on every flight. This has to be Akron Canton. <laughs> This, is, this has to be Akron Can. I guess I'll get a phone number when I switch over to ground. <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for me. Hopefully, this was uh, an eye opening experience and some people learned some things. If you have any other questions, feel free to send us an email hello at spreadaviation.com. Uh, if there's anything you want to see, topics covered, uh, any area of aviation that I may be able to use the simulator for, you know, feel free to, to, to send it our way. Uh, that's, that's what we're here for. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Juan. If you enjoyed it, tell your friends. If you didn't, tell your enemies. We'll take their money, too. Have a great night. Be safe. <laughs>